the daddy letters. Letter 6. Choosing him carefully. Dear daughters, The best way to give your marriage a chance to succeed is to only date men who are a good fit for you in every way possible. I said, in every way possible, because there is no such thing as a man who is a perfect fit, but that is no reason to date and risk marrying a man with whom marriage will be difficult. In an earlier letter I explained that feelings, attraction, passion and romance are not dependable indicators of a love that will last. You also hear many people suggesting that lovers should just follow their hearts, but that too is awful advice considering the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful. The heart is a selfish trickster that will spend the future in order to buy a present joy. Love does not conquer all if it is not accompanied by wise choices, a discerning spirit, and required knowledge. With these three companions working in advance of love, we give love a chance to do its work. Picking a good mate requires a thoughtful comparison between what a potential suitor brings to the table, and what you need to live a tranquil married life physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Think clearly about what God wants for you in marriage, and what you need in a marriage, given your unique personality, interests, and priorities. Enter the dating process with a list of well-considered characteristics you can use to assess suitors. Clearly define the characteristics that are non-negotiables, and don't compromise on those. For example, a clear non-negotiable should be that any potential suitor must be a Christian because the Bible clearly warns against being unequally yoked with unbelievers. You, a child of light, should not bind yourself to a child of darkness, no matter how good he makes you feel or how nice he is to you. Nice and good are not the same thing, because good must be measured by scripture. Nice is often measured by culture. I continue to highly recommend you have a council of trusted advisors to help you evaluate your suitors. Share your list of negotiable and non-negotiable characteristics with your counsel. Choose your counsel well and take their joint opinions as more valuable than your own because your inevitable infatuation will render your judgment untrustworthy. Finances are not romantic, but they are important. As the cliché goes, romance needs finance. Financial problems are the number one cause of marital discord, so it matters that you marry a man with the necessary earning capacity to provide you the kind of lifestyle you want, or at least a lifestyle you can adjust to. Lifestyle considerations must include, housing you can be happy with types of neighborhoods you want, furnishings, automobiles, travel and vacations, quality of clothing, private or public schools, entertainment, hobbies, eating out, jewelry, philanthropy, and one of the most overlooked is the ability to provide sufficient income to retire well. If you plan to have children, determine if his income alone can support the family during and after pregnancy, especially if you plan to be a stay-at-home mom. If his economic profile is insufficient, then you must decide if you can settle for less, fill the gap with your income, or if you need to end the relationship and trust God to send you someone else. Analyze his career choice because frankly, depending upon the career, the wife might be part of the job too, as is the case in politics and top executive roles. Determine if you can stomach the demands his job will make upon you and the family. For example, if you need lots of attention or predictable time together, do not marry a high-level executive or surgeon. If you hate living under public scrutiny do not marry a politician. If you marry a man in a career incompatible with your needs, you will find yourself putting pressure on him to give more than his job will allow and still be successful. Then over time the pressure he feels from you, and the neglect you feel from him, will collide and upset marital tranquility. Next, pay close attention to his manners, habits, idiosyncrasies, quirks, and peccadilloes. These might seem cute when passion is strong and new, but in the grind of day-to-day -day married life, these same traits can corrode affection, and even generate resentment. Does he laugh too loud, chew with his mouth open, dress improperly for occasions, cut you off mid-sentence, eat like a caveman, over-prioritize his buddies, listen poorly, or plan poorly? These traits can have the effect of water torture, and are important enough to call it quits while dating, depending upon your legitimate level of tolerance. Other questions to consider are, do you share the same desire for children in terms of having them and how many? What about parenting principles? Can he act as the leader and spiritual high priest in your home? Will he be the kind of father you want for your children? Is he able and willing to protect and defend you and your home? Does he make you a better person? Do you have enough hobbies and interests in common to serve as bonding activities? Does he listen, act on requests, and make changes when you tell him what you need? Does he have a checkered past or might bring baggage to the marriage that will be disruptive or hard to accept, baggage such as budget draining alimony payments, 
child support payments, or serious mental problems. Only you can decide what you can or cannot live with, so it is important to conduct an honest self-examination and know what you need. Only then can you give yourself a chance to make the best choice for your marital future. I hope you notice that I put the least emphasis on what our current dating custom emphasizes most, and that is your compatibility with him in romance and sex. That is because, if all the other factors are solid, your mutual admiration, friendship, and connection will grow, and those will create a strong desire for physical expression. If you and he are open-minded, creative, adventurous, and committed to pleasing one another, that enthusiasm will make you want to learn how to be the lover each other needs. In the area of physical and romantic love, you have the formidable force of primal urges, and sensual human nature, working for you, but in evaluating the practical qualifications of a mate, these same primal forces work against you. Some people believe it is important to enter marriage with well-developed sexual skills, but that is a lie straight from the enemy. There is nothing that creates a strong bond more than developing those skills together. In addition, you also avoid carrying noisy memories into your marriage that may affect your ability to focus on your mate. To my married daughters, if you realize the connection between you and your husband is weak, determine which loves are weakest, and then nurture the ones that are the strongest so those sustain you until the others mature. You and your husband might be great friends, filio, and genuinely enjoy one another's company, but you have a weak familial connection, storge, meaning he might have little to no interest in having children. In that case you might create more opportunities to enjoy your friendship and increase that important bond. With a strong filio, or friendship connection, you can call upon that when you are frustrated by your store day disconnect. Out of your godly, agape, love, you may be willing to sacrifice the kind of store day connection you dreamed of, on behalf of a compromise you can live with. For example, the two of you might agree that your focus will be more on Christian ministry than having a family with children. No marriage is perfect in all six loves, so don't be disappointed when you discover what is lacking in your relationship. Godly love is the love that can rescue you from deficiency in all others. It is a foundation upon which you can strengthen the weak loves, and help you be contented with your broken dreams. The fact that arranged marriages still work well today should be encouraging, because some arranged couples started with almost none of the six loves, but in time they developed epic levels in each. Your mother and I look forward to all you girls joining us for dinner after church next Sunday. It seems I have to invite my girls over to get her to make that sweet potato casserole I like. Oh, and which one of you is bringing pie? Of the apple variety. Love. Dad.